Chat. I'm your host, Brian Obuchukwu, and on this week's episode, we will be reviewing The Man from Tallahassee and Expose, the 13th and 14th episodes from Season 3 of Lost. We open up to Locke, who is getting a disability evaluation for his depression and I love the great reveal in the open of the episode here where we're meant to believe that he is crippled but he actually just has the mental illness of being depressed awesome scene this episode will really play on your expectations on what you see and really does a great job of painting the picture through John Locke's eyes awesome opening scene In the jungle, they see Jack and communion with the others and living among them and actually shaking Ben's hands. Kate, Saeed, and Locke are all at the barracks and trying to figure out what to do and how to get Jack back because he seems to be totally in cahoots with these people. So they argue about how to proceed and what's going on and then Locke just lays it out. He says, come on, this is Jack. He obviously has a plan. If he's working with them, he's got a reason. Let's give him a choice. At night, we'll go in there. We'll give him the option to go out there. Locke is the best here. This is the best he's ever at. In this episode, I really love him. He's just a massive force of good and does everything right, I feel. It's really great to see him just have the ideas and just solve all these problems. And this takes us into our flashback where Locke has a kid knock at his door. And I love this scene where he opens the door and he says, No soliciting. They have a sign. He is so not himself. It's the complete opposite or black and white, which will be a huge theme in this episode of what we've seen from Locke in this entire episode and how we'll see him. He's so diminished here. He's nothing. He's fallen to his absolute worst. And this kid, he can't even turn away. He'll still talk to a guy, even though he has a sign that says no solicitors. But we find out the kid is worried about his mother, who's dating Anthony Cooper. And Locke lies about donating his kidney. He says that I did it anonymously. He didn't do it for him. Sends him away. Why does he lie? To protect his father? Or maybe he has another motive for lying. But I did want to point out something from Joey, who emailed this week. When Locke pulls out coffee mugs to serve this kid, he pulls out a black and a white mug. Again, this theme will be throughout the entire episode. We return to the barracks where Kate finds Jack inside his house and then once again doesn't listen to what anybody says and just, you know, goes right in and jumps ahead without any consequences in mind or anything like that because things aren't as they seem. He's being watched, and then she gets them all captured, but Jack complies. He seems to be totally okay with it. Has he actually been brainwashed? This takes us to where Locke is, because they only get Saeed and Kate. Locke has actually broken into Ben's house. He has a plan, but just as he is going to get into it, Tom comes to the door, he takes Alex into the closet and hides there. Ben asks for the man from Tallahassee. Is this some sort of crazy other, we don't know, is this a code word for something? We're all thinking what Locke is thinking because he comes out and asks that exact same question. What he really wants is Saeed's pack and he's going to hold Ben hostage. Alex is going to go get that pack for him. This jumps us into our flashback where Locke finds Anthony Cooper and calls him out. He says, you need to blow off this wedding. You can't go through with it. This is not going to happen again. I'm not going to let you do this to somebody else. He's standing up to his father. He's finally doing what he couldn't do when he was younger. We now return to Ben's house where Ben tells John that he knows everything about him, just like Mikael did in the other episode. But he gets specific and he knows exactly how Locke got crippled. And he knows that Locke wants to blow up the sub. Because if they went to the flame, that's why he would want to go there. He wants to blow up the sub, and that is not a good thing for Ben. We now go to the game room where Jack sits AC Slater style on a chair and talks to Kate. He tells her that the kids are safe from the tail section of the plane, the one that Anna Lucia was talking about. She referenced them, and you can tell she's just totally just betrayed and feels bewildered by what's going on with Jack. And I don't think we understand here why he is complying so much. I think we're all supposed to be in the same boat, but this gets explained in this scene right here. He tells her that they are letting him go home, and that is why he didn't want her to come back, and that he wishes that she wouldn't have come back because he was not going to return with help. I think that once he saw her come back, he realized that there was still hope for him and her, 
And he decided in this moment that he has to try to find a way to come back and save her. Because in this scene, you see them get really close and really intimate. The closest they've ever gotten. They kissed that one time. And yeah, her and Sawyer had that thing. But I really want to call back to that scene with her and Sawyer coming back to the beach. It was like they had their own little vacation and this sort of understanding and parting of ways when they returned to the beach. You know, they returned as Sawyer and Kate, not as James and Kate, the couple. They returned as themselves, and I think Kate realized that this whole thing with Sawyer was just part of of what happened in them being captured. Not necessarily what she really felt, which I think in this scene is hinting at her really loving Jack, because this scene is so tender and nice between the two, and I think he was ready to let go, but he says he would, he is coming back for her now, and I think that's why he didn't want her to return, because he knew he couldn't let go. This takes us into our flashback, where we find out that kid's dead, and they suspect that John Locke is the person who did it or might know about it, since his address was in that kid's pocket. I love calling him the kid. I know we know his name. I think it's Peter Talbot. The fact that I remember it is insane, but I loved calling him the kid this whole time because it's funnier to me. This takes us back to Ben's house, where Ben wants to know. He just cuts down to it. He wants to know how fast the healing occurred because he knows that John was paralyzed and he knows it's not happening for him and Ben I think in this whole scene really what you get from it what they're exchanging is that Ben wants what Locke has with this island he's lived here his whole life and he's gotten cancer and now he's not recovering fast enough but John Locke who's never been here and never done anything for this island He's magically healed and can walk again and has all of this understanding of what the island is. While this is happening, Alex goes to retrieve her pack from outside, meets up with Saeed, and he basically tells her that her mother is still alive. And this scene, awesome. Love that they keep hinting at this. Love that loss dangles us along without confirming something so that there are certain things that people who don't normally dig deep into a show are strung along with and can still get that big payoff, just like we do when we figure out these great little secrets together on this show. But this takes us back inside when Ben talks to Locke about the magic of the island and tells him that this island can do so much for him, and Locke corrects him. He says that he's a hypocrite, and he's calling him that because they know of the magic of this island, but what are they doing about it? They live in their houses. They know they're crashed on the other side of the island, and they could probably use their help. But rather than trying to help them, they're terrorizing them, they're being up on their high horses, they're living in their homes with their TVs and their book clubs and all of their electricity, but they they are hypocrites because they won't share. And Locke is saying, if you understood what this island was and what it could do for you, you wouldn't care about these things, and you guys aren't living up to what you say. I think that's really his point here, and that's why he calls him a hypocrite. And he knows, and he asserts his knowledge of the island here, and Ben cannot understand it. And it's really great. This writing here is so good. He gets it. He understands what's going on in this island, and I want you guys to get that from this scene, because that's what Locke is trying to say. If you're wavering, I'm telling you, don't. He is he has got it. He's been on top of understanding what the island is. He only wavered that one time and he realized from that point how he was wrong and he admitted it and was willing to move forward with it. So this is great. Locke is dead set on blowing up the sub and Ben tells him that hey, it's a one-way ticket anyways. The sub won't come back because we don't know how to get here since the anomaly. And Locke does not listen, has Alex escort him, and she just plain out tells him, you know he's manipulating you, right? He's doing it somehow. He wants you to do something, he makes you think it's your idea. Really want you to think about all of the things we know about John Locke up to this point. What kind of person he is, and how he's been able to be persuaded to do things and think it's his idea. Maybe the show is telling us exactly what's happening right now. Really, really awesome. Back in Ben's house, Jack comes in and asks for one more favor. Ben agrees to let his friends go once he leaves the island. 
love his wording here, this proves Alex's point from the last scene that Ben is always manipulating people. And I really want you to think about that in general, in the context of Ben and what we've seen him do so far and how he's kind of played people against each other down in the hatch and then kind of actually even when he had Sawyer, Kate, and Jack all locked up. It's almost like he got exactly what he wanted out of it. Hmm... Again, maybe we should listen to it since his wording, knowing what Locke is going to do, he says, once you leave the island. Locke blows up the sub and everybody is pissed. (laughs) This takes us into our flashback where we see exactly how Locke got crippled. He goes and confronts Anthony Cooper and wants him to prove that he isn't going to screw this person over and he gets thrown out of a window and he breaks his back, but he didn't die. And the nurse in the flashback here brings up to John the one line that we keep hearing from him in every episode. He says, don't tell me what you can't do, Mr. Locke. You survived that fall. Pretty big. Maybe, maybe the point of that line is really for us to think about what it means. Don't tell me what I can't do. Why would you listen to somebody else about what you know you can and cannot do. You should really just always go for it yourself. And if you look at how John Locke is when he embraces it, and he has faith in it, and he believes that he can do it, he's unstoppable. But when he doubts himself like he has in the past, it leads him to all of these horrible places. And he can keep doing more. He just has to try. And on the island, he can try. And we realize why he can here. And that's because on the island, he doesn't have any way of being screwed by his father. And we see that in the scene here where Locke is in custody. And of course, Locke realizes that he's being used the whole time. But Ben tells him that really the thing that you did for me was you solved my Jack problem. Jack was going to leave the island and he was going to be totally screwed looking bad no matter what. And in blowing up the submarine, he was able to solve the Jack problem. And it's great that Locke has just been used again by Ben, and now Ben tells him, let me show you what came out of this magical box that I was talking about. And we open the door, and who is the one person that Locke does not want to see on this island? It's his father. And this episode really did a great job of playing on your perspective. You viewed this episode entirely in the perspective of John Locke. We were very amenable to coercion, just like he was profiled to be. We were amenable to persuasion because we saw it through his perspective. And what makes Lost so interesting, and what makes these episodes so masterful, is that they give you such a nuance of a character, and they make you fall into that perspective. Because when we hear that there's a box that something can come out of, if you wished for it, And then you see that guy on the island, you see Anthony Cooper, Locke's father, you don't know what to believe at that point. And that takes us into Expose, which is one of the most, I think, contested episodes of this show. I'd been hinting about it the entire time because I was hoping to point out blaringly to you folks how just weird these characters were to be shoehorned into the show. Nobody really liked these characters. I mean, I'm always an open mind to new characters and new things, and especially with a show like Lost, I always had good faith in it because I felt like they were going to pay off pretty well because they had shown that they prepared and wrote stuff that would pay off later or they would tie it in somehow. So they did that in this episode, and I think that that's what makes Expose one of the most interesting episodes of Lost because it was a direct reaction to how the fans were seeing this episode. Uh, They didn't really care for these characters. They really felt like, who are these two people that you're trying to put in? Maybe the plan originally was to keep them around for bigger and better things to fill up the, you know, background characters, people, or maybe their plan the entire time was to build two characters up to make you think that you're going to have to deal with these two crappy new characters only to kill them in the end. I can't say, maybe it's said somewhere, that's not for me to speculate, but this is why this episode is one of the coolest ones, because it really 
continues to play on your perspective. Season 3 does a great job of lulling you into a security that is never there to begin with. And I think it's because of the introduction of the character of Ben, who I'm pretty sure won an Emmy for his role. Um, Michael Emerson, the actor who plays Ben, I'm pretty sure won an Emmy for this role. So let's go into the episode. We open up to Nikki, who is frantically running through the jungle and buries something off into the sand, runs away, and then takes us into our flashback where Nikki, we find out, is not a stripper but an actor on the set of a TV show and she's in love with a director. They're walking out of the set. I love the comments here. They really wrote this episode to be funny because they kind of just tell you about some stuff like, oh, what happens to guest stars? They always die. Love it. There's all these nuances throughout the episode about what's going to happen to these two characters. It's really funny. I'll point all of them out for you folks that I noticed. This takes us back to the beach where Nikki comes out of the jungle, mutters something very quietly, and then just collapses. And Sawyer's response to her, as always, is, who the hell is Nikki? This takes us into our flashback where we find out that Nikki and Paolo are working to steal this director's diamonds out of his safe. That they are actually horrible people, and just like most of the people on this Flight 815, con artists in some way or another. We also see in this part that Paolo does not have an attention to detail because he tries to light a cigarette while they're trying to steal diamonds. He doesn't think about leaving evidence behind. Really good to put that in right at the beginning of the episode. And throughout the episode, they put these little tie-ins into these characters, these character flaws that they had to tell you really quick so that they could show you them at the end. But it is explained. So look back. Notice them all. It's really, really cool. They get onto the beach where they're trying to figure out what happened to Nikki. And Hugo realizes that what she said was Paolo lies. And now he's all in a fervor. He needs to figure out what's going on. This takes us into our flashback where we see just exactly how Nikki and Paolo got on the island. We see them in the airport. And I love the line here between Paolo and Nikki. He says, I hope we don't end up like them. Really, uh... Really ironic line that he goes there. And I love that Nikki is really concerned with where the bag went right after they crashed. Thought that was great to have right in the opening. Their flashbacks really tie them into the story very, very well and kind of fills in some gaps for other things that I thought was just really honestly cute. It was really unique and different. They didn't need to tie them into the show so well, but they did. They put them there at all these main points for the show, even small stuff like Boone and Shannon arguing in the airport. They gave us them in every same location that all of these main characters did. Really interesting because... As you're watching this episode, you're starting to get these characters more and be interested by them. Opinions of these characters changed by the end of the episode. I think that was their intention. Really, really enjoyed that. This takes us back to the jungle where we find out that Paolo is just as dead as Nikki and Sawyer seems to be distracted. And the only one again who notices is Hurley. Jumping back into the flashback, we see the story tied into the rest of the cast, but this time with Ethan. He's being very helpful with these two, trying to tell them where some of the stuff might have fallen, and he says that the plane split up, the middle of the plane fell over the jungle, and he knows this because he watched the plane crash. He could see it from his side of the island, and that's how he knows where the stuff went, but he was a very helpful person. Why was he so helpful at the beginning? Other helpful people are Arns for the very obvious reason of he's being manipulated by a cute chick in a bikini top. So she tells him about her luggage and how she needs help finding it because she needs somebody to figure out trajectory. So she's using another older man to get exactly what she wants from him, just like she did with that director. Maybe this is a pattern. We don't know. We just seen it in these two. Nikki and Paolo use the map to find the plane and the question mark way before Locke and Echo ever do. But I love how they both just didn't bother to go inside. They had their own focus the entire time. He wanted to go down into the hatch. She wanted him to go up into the plane. Neither of them wanted to do it for each other. So they all go away. (laughs) I love this scene. I love that they hit these parts before other people on the show and then didn't mention it to anybody else. It gives us a different perspective for people who you didn't see at all before and kind of, again, fills in these strange little gaps. Like, oh, well... If the main characters that we're all following with 
are lying about what they're seeing in the jungle, maybe these secondary characters or even like tertiary characters are finding stuff and going, you know what, we're not going to tell anybody about this plane or this hatch that we found. We just care about our diamonds. This takes us back to the beach where they are investigating what happened to both of them. They find a walkie-talkie from the others in their camp. They're going through their stuff and they see one of these walkie-talkies. And this makes them start to suspect that something else might be going on, that they might be working with these others. This takes us into our flashback where Kate reveals the location of the Halliburton case with the guns, which gives them the idea to go check that same lagoon to see if their bag fell in there. And it totally had, but Paolo lies about finding it and keeps it for himself. And maybe this is what she meant by Paolo lies at the beginning of the episode. So that takes us back to the beach where Sawyer is now under investigation. He wants to do a perimeter sweep. He seems, again, distracted. He thinks that something else might be going on. I think if you just notice him, because Hugo, they keep cutting to him, and he just doesn't trust anything that Sawyer's doing. Everybody still thinks that they're now with the others, that maybe the others just tried to kill them, and they're the ones who did it. Sun brings up her attack in front of both Charlie and Sawyer. Man, that's a that's a pretty heavy scene to be standing right next to the person you attacked and then to have them uh, bring up that subject. Now we'll return to the flashback where we see Locke tell Paolo that things on the island don't stay buried for very long because the beach is eroding. He's also, in this moment, talking about the hatch that he just found to him. But Paolo goes back to that Pearl Station, goes to the bathroom, but we realize what he hides down in the bathroom. In that time, though, he sees Ben and Juliet come down and observe them in the hatch. And they're basically talking about how Ben gets what he wants. He finds what people are emotionally invested in, and then he exploits it. Which, again, explains exactly what has been happening between him, Kate, Sawyer, and Locke. He seems to just manipulate everybody around him by taking what they love or what they're emotionally invested in and using it against them. They leave the walkie-talkie behind, so we now know they don't work with the others. And while this is all happening, Vincent is trying to pull the blanket off of both Nikki and Paolo, and he's whimpering the whole time. And I think that once you realize what happens to them at the end of this episode, this scene is kind of a big indication for them to maybe have listened to Vincent in this scene, but I don't know. We also see Charlie confess to attacking Sun, and she just walks off. She doesn't say anything. This takes us back to the Pearl, and we see when everybody goes there, Paolo goes in to retrieve the diamonds. Now we know why he flushed the toilet, and this explains that scene. I I mean, come on, we're watching it at that point, and we're like, who is this freaking guy? And you have to imagine that they maybe did this on purpose. Because you hated these characters, but they actually contributed to the show in some way and and filled in these gaps. I mean, people hated them. I really just wanted to know what they were doing with them and the way that they used these characters in this episode were incredible. We now go onto the beach where they continue to dig the graves for Nikki and Paolo. Sawyer returns. He figures out what she had hid, and they all catch him for it, because Hurley was onto him the whole time. And so he just gives the diamonds away to Sun. This takes us into our flashback, where we see the morning argument between Nikki and Sawyer. We see that she's trying to get a gun from Sawyer, because she has figured out that Paolo has been lying to her. His pack of gum that he left behind that morning was the indicator. He leaves evidence behind. So she knew that once he found that gum that he had found the diamonds, and he'd been keeping it from her. So she knows he's been lying, and she wanted a gun. He obviously doesn't want to give one to her because he realizes that she's so upset she's going to do something stupid. He's actually being responsible in this scene. This returns to the beach, where Sun is the only one who understands that these diamonds are worthless. That even though they may have $8 million worth of diamonds, they're worth no money. She slaps Sawyer for his scheme, and this ties up that little arc. I wondered if they were ever going to touch this again because, man, they really did attack her and they never tied that up. They just kind of went on with it. And I appreciate that they came back, tied it up. She said, it's not going to go anywhere because my husband would kill you. 
understand what you did and what I'm giving you right now. We get to their funeral. Hurley is actually the one who leads the funeral for them. It's a pretty sad scene. Sawyer tosses in the diamonds and they are being put to rest. We return to eight hours ago where we see exactly what happened to Nikki and Paolo. How she fed him the Medusa spider, got him paralyzed so that she could bind the diamonds off of him. But now I want you to think about what that means. It was eight hours ago, which yes, is one of the numbers, but she explains the paralysis from the spider bite lasts for eight hours. A little point before I go here. Right before all the little spiders come up and one of them bites Nikki, you hear the little ticking, the rattling of the smoke monster noise behind him. So maybe it was the smoke monster that killed these two. Who's to say? But we definitely heard it before they died. So that's something that I wanted to make sure you guys had picked up on. And also, we find out they're being buried alive because they're paralyzed. And she opens her eyes right before they put the final mound of dirt on them. But they are underground alive. That is some sort of crazy stuff. Guys, I don't even think Game of Thrones gets that crazy. I don't see another show that gets that crazy, where they bury two characters alive, they make you start to kind of like these two characters, and then they bury them alive. That's pretty intense. But, guys, that takes us to our end of the episode. Thank you so much to everybody who emailed me in this week. Really appreciate it. Next week, we will be reviewing Left Behind and One of Us. Guys, email me your thoughts, questions, theories, everything you want to know about Lost. We go back podcast at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at King Lord Brian. Until next week, folks, have a good time.